He was one of Estonia's greatest composers, but is among its least known. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Eduard Tubin. Tubin was born in June 1905, in the country that would become Estonia, but at that point it was still just a part of the sprawling Russian Empire. He had two siblings, but they both died of various maladies, leaving Edward the only child in the family to see the age of 23. The Tubin's home was on a lake that, today, forms part of the border between Estonia and Russia. His father was fluent in the Brass family, and several of his uncles were also in the town orchestra. But other than this, very little is known of his family and early life. But what is known is that both of his parents were musical enough that they wanted Edward to get a start in music. And so when he was 13 years old, his father got him a piano by selling a calf. But it wasn't just the parents telling him to learn music. He was very interested in music himself, and he taught himself to play several instruments, not the least of which was the flute. Of course, he couldn't actually practice on the flute because his hands were at that point still too small to grasp the standard concert flute, so he'd practice on a piccolo instead, often during the summer months when he was supposed to be minding the pigs. Somehow the pigs didn't mind, even though this was, you know, a piccolo. One time at his school, he broke into an orchestra rehearsal to tell the teacher that all the instruments were out of tune. And the teacher said, well, okay, well, you tune them up, and, and he did. Tubin ended up in Tartu, Estonia's second largest city, when he was 15. This was the first time he had the opportunity to hear an actual, professional, quality, full-fledged symphony orchestra perform, and he began composition lessons with Haino Eller. Eller was not only highly thought of as a composer, he was highly thought of as a composition teacher as well, and in many respects he can be considered the father of Estonian music, or at least the Estonian tradition as it is a subset of the more broad classical world. Eller's teaching style encouraged a razor-sharp approach to any music that a student brought in. He didn't really care for what style it was, so long as it was good and was written with a sense of conviction. Lessons were almost like seminars, and they could last up to five hours. In all, Tubin studied for six years in Tartu, and he emerged into an Estonia where music was just turning the corner from being considered a provincial pastime to be considered an actual occupation. Not to be outdone on the well-roundedness front, Tubin also learned the organ and added that to the litany of instruments that he could play. Although it was very much a job to him, he did not like playing in churches because he hated sitting through the sermons. He roomed with Eduard Oya, a violinist friend from school with compositional aspirations, and together they lived a thoroughly unsanitary life. Think about every disgusting bachelor stereotype, that was them. According to Tubin's son, Eno, who has written the first, and as far as I can tell, only comprehensive biography of his father in any language, the two Edwards would eat sausage, throw the casings on the floor, and then they would sit there until the weekly cleanup. And the weekly cleanup would involve a broom and a shovel. A shovel. Indoors. Anyway, Tubin was also enrolled in the Tallinn Conservatory, located in the Estonian capital. This was for a couple reasons. One, the school in Tartu did not issue diplomas. And second, if he was in the top rung of his class in Tallinn, he would avoid the draft. And military service just wasn't something that appealed to him. Yet even after his double graduation and his successful ploy to avoid military conscription, he still never stopped talking to Eller. He became an old mentor slash drinking buddy. Tubin's music often makes use of folk songs, but not in a literal way. This is part and parcel for the cultural zeitgeist. The world in which he lived was a world where artists were opening their eyes to the vast cultural well of inspiration that existed within their homelands and in their native cultures. Why this happened so late in Estonia vis-a-vis -vis other lands is probably because historically Estonia had been part of something else. For much of the last thousand years, Estonia had not been independent. However, they still had the second largest collection of folk tunes outside Ireland, 
and to being intended to make use of this great tradition. When you're looking at a composer of this era, the right question is sometimes not if a composer used folk tunes or folk idioms, but rather how well the composer did so. And in Tubin's case, he did a very, very good job. The Hungarian composer Zoltán Kodály was also a significant influence on Tubin. Even though they didn't meet for very long, if at all, Kodály did encourage the Estonian to make use of his uh, Estonian-ness. Tubin was skilled at weaving these into his own music. Much like Jean Sibelius in Finland, to whom Tubin's symphonies are often compared, he rarely used literal folk tunes. Rather, he was able to create folk tunes of his own imagining. This is perhaps most notable not in one of his symphonies, but rather in his ballet Krat, which translates to the Goblin. It took rather a long time for a performance of this piece to be mounted, and when it did, accidents just kept befalling it. So much so that some considered the piece to be cursed. The full score was burned, when a performance in February 1944 was brutally interrupted by the theater getting bombed. While Tubin was later able to piece the score back together from his piano reduction and some of the surviving parts, the piece still has a penchant for being cursed, and sometimes even modern productions will include a little talisman to ward off the evil eye. At this point, Tubin's career was looking up. His second symphony was making the rounds, as was the incidental music he'd written for several plays. He was actually recommended to get a state salary to help his compositional career, much as the Finns had done with their national hero of Jean Sibelius. But at the very last minute, his detractors and haters thwarted the scheme. To add insult to another insult, I suppose, Tubin is not as well known in part because he had to flee his homeland. Soviet forces occupied the Baltic states, and the communist reign of terror was just beginning. Anyone with the means to get out, was desperate to do so. While Tubin initially benefited from the existence of the Soviet Estonian Composers Union, the evils of the Marxist regime would raise their ugly heads in due time. Laws were enacted retroactively, people were sent en masse to Siberian gulags, and legions of able-bodied men were drafted into the Red Army to fight against the Nazis on the Eastern Front a front from which people rarely returned on either side. Yet despite the Soviets' best efforts, the Nazis still reached the Estonian borders, and they too committed horrible atrocities. They rounded up the Jewish and Roma population of the Baltic state and summarily executed almost every single one of them. The Nazis also systematically sapped what remained of Estonia's economy for their own despicable ends. When the Red Army came storming back through Estonia, as the war was drawing ever closer to its conclusion, 80,000 Estonians used the chaos to flee. Tubin and his family found themselves on an overcrowded ship that left the port of Tallinn in September of 1944. The ship was carrying two and a half times its maximum capacity, and the engines seized up in the middle of the Baltic Sea, they were left adrift for two days until the Swedes found them and dragged the ship to Stockholm. Thus, the two beans settled in Sweden, and eventually they would become Swedish citizens. But his long absence from his homeland meant that he simply wasn't as well known as other Estonian composers. People didn't know his name as much as they knew the name of his teacher, Eller, or later on, the contemporary sacred minimalist Arvo Pert. The important thing was that Tubin was safe from dictators of any mustache size, and he was lucky to end up in Sweden, because Sweden had a particularly interesting way of using the various refugees that came to their shores. They didn't just put them in refugee camps. If you did physical labor as your profession, then you were given that job again. If you were an artist, though, you became an archivist. See, Sweden had a lot of old theaters and palaces and libraries lying around, and they needed people to go through these and figure out what was in there, and in some cases, rework them and update them and make new editions of the stuff that they found. This was Tubin's job. He was in an old palace outside of Stockholm, and half the time he was dedicated to trudging through these old works and seeing what he could save, seeing what he could reorganize and refile. And the other half of the time, he could write his own pieces, which meant that he had enough free time to crank out some of his best works 
and biggest works. He brought many great works back to life in his job as an archivist and an editor, not the least of which was a Haydn opera. He reconstructed and reorchestrated it from a piano score that he found. Of course, I guess no one told him that no one really puts on Haydn operas anymore, but to be fair, Tubin was always a big fan of the late Franz Josef, especially his method of developing themes in humorous ways. When Swedish critics discussed his music, which wasn't super often, they often talked about the Fifth Symphony, or contemporary pieces, to the Fifth Symphony. Why? Well, it speaks to a larger issue. The Swedes, by and large, were not actually all that interested in the works that Tubin wrote when he was in Estonia. They preferred instead the pieces he wrote while he was on their soil. The name of Dmitri Shostakovich was often bandied about as a point of comparison, but out of all of his contemporaries, Tubin actually didn't like old Shosti all that much. When asked of his favorite composers, Tubin would often mention Bartok and Stravinsky, and Prokofiev. He admired Bartok's ability to create folk-like tunes without ever really needing to directly quote folk music, and he was actually at the premiere for the Hungarian's music for strings, percussion, and celeste. Not to be outdone, Tubin was also such a big Prokofiev fan that he got the Russian to sign a concert poster that he had. The Shostakovich comparison is especially intriguing and one that warrants a little bit more of an in-depth study. Tubin is often seen by Estonians as someone who wrote powerful personal political statements into his music, someone who is always saying something meta. Much like Shostakovich is seen as a composer who did the same thing, but in regards to Stalin and the political repression that he and all of his fellow artists faced in the Soviet Union. On the other hand, the Swedes didn't regard Tubin's music as saying anything personal at all. Perhaps Tubin didn't feel like the comparison was justified on musical grounds, but it's also possible that he didn't want to burn the few bridges he had left to his homeland, now Soviet Estonia. He liked American music of all stripes, and he disliked how Wagnerian operas were staged, as he thought it was stifling and entirely unnatural. What also perhaps has contributed to Tubin's lesser-known status was that he was largely, but not totally, immune to the musical tendencies of his era. He remained a staunch anti-communist, but at the same time didn't really see any problem writing in an accessible style, even though at the time accessibility was considered a hallmark of communism because the communists at least in Russia, were told to write music that was accessible to the people, and if it was too far advanced, it was branded as formalist and you were sent to the gulags. At one point, his relative conservatism was seen as a brash modernism, as he and several other of his elder disciples were branded as being too influenced by the French Impressionists. In time, public perception flipped, and he now found himself on the conservative end of the spectrum, writing all sorts of traditional music in traditional forms, while the rest of the Western world was trying to make music as mathematically rigorous as they possibly could. Combined with what was basically eternal refugee status, and the Swedes really didn't want to have all that much to do with him. Sure, they were nice to him, but he never felt like he was one of the boys. Anyway, what was happening in Estonia? Estonia had been occupied and was now thoroughly behind the Iron Curtain, and Tubin's music was banned for a long while, in the late 40s and early 50s. The authorities relaxed their stance on Tubin, in part to see if they could lure him back to his homeland. The Estonians were always very fiercely independent, and the Soviets thought that they could possibly quell the revolutionary thoughts and tendencies of the people if they were able to bring some of these old Estonian artists back into the fold. But Tubin was too sly for their games. He was having none of it. He did visit, but he always made sure that he was able to get out, in part because at this point he'd attained Swedish citizenship. When it became clear that Tubin would not fall for the bait of dangling Estonian performances and Estonian commissions in front of his face, they banned his music again. Ironically, his double bass concerto had become a staple amongst Russian music students. It became a risk for him to even visit Estonia in the 1960s, but he felt like he had to. He felt like he had to be a beacon of hope to the younger generation of artists who were stuck under the brutal regime of the authoritarians, with no option to escape like he did. While his Swedish citizenship protected him a little bit, it also opened him up to some hilariously draconian tax laws, 
which he found ways of avoiding. So American. Thus to being toiled, in relative but not total obscurity, with most of the money he made from performances of his works coming from the world that was not called Sweden or Estonia. He didn't even get a lot of money from those either, because, as mentioned, he was still kind of an obscure figure. But that luck changed in 1980, when the Estonian expatriate Nema Jarvi, a conductor, came to the United States, and his prolific concertizing and recording helped bring about a revival of interest in Tubin's music. Unfortunately, Tubin did not live long enough to enjoy his newfound success. He passed away in November of 1982 at the age of 77, after a long battle with prostate cancer, which is not usually the kind of cancer that heavy smokers like Tubin typically get. Neme Yarvi would soon go on to fulfill the promise he made to Tubin on his deathbed, that he was going to record his complete symphonic cycle. Tubin wrote a lot of music, but is primarily known today for his ten completed symphonies. There is some debate as to how he felt about programmatic music. He outwardly questioned if music, shorn from its program notes, could actually manage to represent what it's intended to represent. But at the same time, he also would often give subtitles to his pieces, things that indicated that he was thinking of some kind of programmatic background or narrative. On the other hand, musicologists really love music that has a program, so maybe they're just reading into it. Here's the thing, though. He loved writing for film and plays, and his dislike of programmatic music crops up in his later years. So we just don't know how he felt about it throughout the course of his life. It's possible that his opinions changed and morphed and evolved. Here's another thing. He didn't like jazz. Specifically, he didn't like the improvisatory aspects of it. And yet he still wrote a symphony where it's all jazz up until the very end. Knowing these two things, is it really possible to make a case that he didn't think that programmatic music existed? I don't know. That's one of the great mysteries about Tubin's work. Complicating matters here was his dislike of self-promotion. He didn't ever like asking for favors, either. Before World War II, publishing music in Estonia was rare, and often a crapshoot. And Sweden wasn't all that much better, either. There was a distinct lack of professional and competent copyists and editors. And so Tubing actually had to do all this grunt work himself if he wanted a piece published and this was just extra work on top of everything he did for the government. Thus, the work of compiling, editing, proofing, and engraving Tubin's work is still something that's an ongoing process. In a world otherwise so enthralled with atonality, he seemed to believe that atonality didn't actually exist. All that really existed was a tonal center that moved around too quickly to notice. At the end of the day, he seemed to just think that atonality was the oral equivalent of the shell game. Even Arnold Schoenberg, he argued, exhibited tonal centers if you looked at the harmonic content. He was not immune. You couldn't get away from implying tonality, even if you didn't want to. Yet, in another irony, he often wrote in an atonal idiom. He just didn't really think of it as being technically atonal in the way that other atonal composers thought it was atonal. His Seventh Symphony combines tonality and atonality, and uses a nearly 12-tone theme in its finale. His music for strings uses a free 12-tone theme that, in Tubin's own words, should not sound like Schoenberg. While he was happy with the product that he created from his experimentation around the edges of the 12-tone technique, he said that writing modernist music was far too easy. He thought serialism was construed and ice-cold. For him, it was not the ideology behind a piece, it was the piece itself, the end product. That's what mattered. He once said, The best times in my life are when my music is played and I can be there myself. And this even extended to rehearsals, which he attended if at all possible. Including first rehearsals, which, I can say from experience, can be kinda rough. He missed Estonia dearly. After all, who in his situation wouldn't? But he was able to have at least a little bit of a sense of humor about it. He was once asked how he coped, and he said, A shot of vodka usually helps. He took to Swedish life and culture and made many friends there, and voted in every election he could after he attained citizenship. But at the same time, he never felt at home there, and they never really felt like he was a part of their culture either. Along with every other Estonian political refugee, he was disheartened 
that Sweden was one of the few countries in the free world to recognize Estonia as part of the Soviet Union. Every other country saw it as an illegal occupation. Yet he had friends who had immigrated to the United States and said that they were not given the same level of job as he got in Sweden. Perhaps it's best to think of Tubin as a world citizen. After all, he spoke five languages, though he was always conscious of possibly screwing up, especially in Swedish. He possessed intimate loves of both chess and nature. He was an avid amateur photographer and filmmaker, and he enjoyed cooking, which he compared to composition. He knew what he liked in art, and he was unafraid of making it even if few were listening. Now, more people than ever have access to Tubin's works, which can only serve to augment his status not just amongst Estonian composers, but in the diverse pantheon of the entire 20th century.